Peace, love, and light family. It's your girl, Morgan Renee Myers, tuning in with you all on this lovely Sunday, March 31st, last day of March in 2019. This year flying by already. So, I came on here to read another chapter from Sister Soldiers No Disrespect. And excuse my nails, I done had a week, honey. They done like broke and did all kind of stuff, paint chip. Anywho, um, but before I get into that, let me showcase some of my creations. So I was in a um, fashion show in Atlanta last week, and this was one of the tops that I had modeled at the show. This is a chain halter top, and I'll show you back. I don't know if y'all can see it, but see this little loop? It's just like one loop keeping it all together and it's really really cute um so i'll be making a slew of these for spring um coming up so yeah i never promote myself when i be doing these videos so i just figured i'd show y'all need to wear my own stuff sometime oh and i made these shorts too which i don't really like these are um let me back up these are chunky shorts so i use two yarns at a time this is what you call variegated yarn um, when it has multiple colors, like you see, it got the black and the blue and all of that. That's how the yarn came. So that's called variegated. And I use two skeins. A skein is, I don't want to step out the camera, but a, that's what a, the two yarn is when you buy it. You call it a skein. So I use two of those at the same time to make these. And I don't like them because they, um, they're chunky and I should have like washed it first so they could be a little softer but that's the key to like acrylic yarns like when you wash them they get softer and especially if you um put them in a dryer inside of like a pillowcase or something like that so again this is my spring edition of my chain halter top okay so y'all gonna be fly this this spring and this summer okay so I'm about to hop into this book though no disrespect by sister soldier Chapter 6, We On Chance. Now, the last chapter was called Mona, and she was talking about her experience with a friend of hers that was a lesbian that was trying to come for her. So, let's see what Chance is about. <clears throat> now, listen to what I'm saying, baby. Now, come on. Dry up your tears. These were the first words that hit my ears after stepping off the bus from my university in New Jersey to the Port Authority Chance to the Port Authority Transit Station in New York City at 42nd Street. The guy who was talking looked to be in his early 40s, but the girl he was talking to was about 12 years old, dressed up as an older woman. The girl was dark-skinned and dirty. Her red, her short red pants were most like pant, were most like panties. Um, thanks, Brother Britton. The girl, okay, let me go back. The girl was dark-skinned and dirty. Her short red pants were more like panties they were so tight that most of the material was lost somewhere in her crack leaving her butt cheeks half exposed they were red and dirty too her halter top which would more accurately be described as a bra was purple her legs were long and ashy somewhere beneath the crust and funk someone might describe them as pretty young and athletic hold on let me fix my camera real quick Now, who took playing Vanessa and gave her a new look and a new name? The older man stood over her confidently as she sat looking up at him from the bench. He wore his hair in long, greasy jerry curls. He talked to her smooth through jagged-edged teeth as though he had recited these lines a thousand times before. The girl looked up at him as if he were her savior and said, You did, try love. Now, when I turned Vanessa into Queen Khadijah, didn't I introduce you to a life of royalty? Didn't I fatten up your pockets? He asked the questions gently as though he really wanted her to think about it. He took the time and patience to position himself to sound and look sincere then he took his dried up long finger with the two inch fingernail and wiped away one of her tears didn't i he asked again softly yes you did she responded seemingly convinced that this guy whom she called try love had put her in a better position by putting money in her pockets and then added without much confidence but i just can't tonight i'm not feeling it such grown-up words for a young girl, I thought. But though she was young, she looked used. Her body hadn't even gone through puberty, and already it had begun to sag in several places. He put his face closer to hers, his big, wide nose covered with pus bumps and blackheads, and said, Queen, what did I tell you to do when you were having a bad day? She smiled gently, exposing her dirty teeth. You said to try, love. Now what's my name? Try, love, she said affectionately. And who's the only one who really loves and protects you? You are a child love, she answered. Now let me tell you what I'm going to do for you. 
He reached into his pockets and pulled out a money clip with a thick stack of 50 and $100 bills. Try Love's Tri going to take Queen Khadijah to Tad Steak for her favorite meal. We're going to get filet mignon and baked potato dripping with butter and cream. He ran his long red tongue over his black lick of his, if he could already taste the meal. But before that, Try Love's going to take you up to see Lorraine so you can get your hair did. She smiled like he had just given her keys to her own new Roy's Royce. And afterwards, if the queen still loves me, I hope she does, she's going to do what makes me happy. Happy. She's going to charm these dudes with her beauty, make them feel real good with that young body and those juicy lips. Then she's going to bring those green bills back to daddy so he can personally show her his appreciation. Now, what's my name, queen? Try love, she said proudly. He grabbed her butt cheek and flashed a smile, asking her like a gentleman, well then, shall we? He extended his arm and she tucked hers in his and to my amazement, they walked off together, both looking satisfied and ready. Now, I had seen pimps and whores before, but I didn't remember whores being 12 years old. I had seen women work the strip for a pimp and even seen the shit get smacked out of them if they were not. But with this pimp, there was no violence, only the illusion of real love and real concern. In fact, there were also illusions of royalty, loyalty, and protection. He had actually convinced this girl that he had made her a queen when she really looked like she had just crawled out the gutter. She who had such evident trust and belief in him that even the smell of her own stinking underarms could not awaken her to her reality. He had convinced her that by giving him all her money that she worked for, he was somehow making her rich. The cruelest joke of all, however, was the way he would the way he could in the same breath tell her to sleep with various strange men and then tell her that he loved her and she would return home to try love where he would be where she would be protected. How could he have so thoroughly convinced her that he was protecting her when it was actually he who was putting her in danger in the first place? The more I thought about it, the angrier I became. But I soon realized that I could not be angry. After all, she was a child and I had read somewhere that children were innocent. But you would think that if she had so much that if she had seen so much in her young short life that she wouldn't be so stupid. I left the Port Authority and hit the street moving swiftly, not wanting to miss my appointment with the Reverend Benjamin F. Chavis, Chavis Jr. Hey, that's a um, library out here in Greensboro, the Benjamin F. Chavis Sprints on Bimbo. Hmm, gotta look this guy up. What did he do? With the Reverend Benjamin F. Chavis Jr., he was the director of the Commission for Racial Justice, which was the civil rights agency of the United Church of Christ. I had met him earlier at a student's rally at college. Impressed by what he said were my leadership skills and political insights. He wanted to offer me a job. Okay, get you some coins. I was reluctant to come to his to his office to discuss such an offer because Chavis was relatively was a relatively young minister and I had heard enough about what a lot of them really wanted. Moreover, my experience had led me to believe that the majority of churches today were not willing to take uncompromising leadership roles in the struggle for justice. But in my hunger, poverty, and confidence of knowing that even if the interview turned out to be a bust, I would never barter my beliefs or be manipulated by him or anyone else, that prompted me to accept his invitation to come to New York, come to New York and give the interview a shot. I was surprised to see after arriving at the commission that it was a legitimate establishment, at least judging by its appearance. I had half respected that the so-called commission might be housed in some semi-abandoned building with a one light bulb office and an illiterate half-naked secretary and a slipshod preacher sitting in a chalkboard cubicle. Instead, I found a clan, large staff in a more than decent Madison Avenue building, bright lights and, pro and people professionally dressed looking serious about their work. The secretary signaled to me that it was my time to see Chavis. I entered a spacious office that was lined with plaques, trophies, and certificates, all made out to Reverend Benjamin Chavis for outstanding service and dedication to the African community. The interview seemed to go well as I listened to this man who had been at one point or another, it seemed, a member of every black organization that had ever existed. The range was impressive, from a moderate group like Martin Luther King's Southern Christian Leadership Conference to the radical movers and shakers of the Black Panther Party with the whole lot in between. He had served four and a half years in prison as one of America's many political prisoners and emerged with a divinity degree from Duke University. He was a chemist, a doctor of philosophy, and a well-known preacher among those people and clergy who had spent their lives challenging the racial and economic injustices of America. We talked about many things, police brutality, apartheid, African liberation movements throughout the world. We shared a critique of some of the past black leaders and organizations and their efforts to reorganize 
recognize our people. As we talked, we became more comfortable with one another. I was sure that he wasn't just some phony preacher trying to use people's pain as a path to their panties. He seemed sure that I wasn't just some fast-talking, tight-pants-wearing student leader out to advance only my own ego and career. He had asked me to meet with him, he said, because he was interested in initiating a nationwide African youth and student movement organized around issues of justice. Somehow he had sensed that I was the person for the job. He told me how desperately the movement needed some new blood to inject new life and new direction to our cause as black people. He added that, unlike many of the leaders that were on the scene now, he was not afraid of surrounding himself with equally dedicated, intelligent, and aggressive young people because he was convinced that if we were going to survive, we would need the contributions of both wise elders and energetic sincere well studied young people that's true to many of them too many of them seem to be selfish materialistic hustlers disconnected from our present day realities he retorted that while this perception was partly true there were he said some good elders and workers nonetheless he added that i should remember that as far as many of the elders were concerned today's youth were a bunch of misguided heathens who were unwilling to sacrifice anything and hell-bent on creating the worst image of african people in our entire history so the objective of the job in addition to the creation of a nationwide student and youth movement was to help close the many gaps that existed in our community. Gaps between young and old, between young people who attended college and young people who did not, between the under, lower, and middle class. I was to try to bring together African youth from Africa, the Caribbean, and America. I accepted the challenge Chavis offered me with the stipulation that the church would not try to pacify me or confine me with its sometimes artificial limitations. I would spend the entire next year at the commission researching the conditions of our people in various parts of the nations. I had to look at urban, suburban, and rural youth. I established contact with the many student leaders and organizers on campuses from every region. I drew on many of the people I had come to know from organizing at college. I coupled this information with the resources of the commission, which included to computers, newspapers, journals from all over the world, telephones, printing press, and all the way and access that can be gained through being connected to a large institution. While I was satisfied that I was making progress in bringing many student organizers from around the country together in a dialogue that needed to happen, I was concerned about how I would now include in a productive way those brothers and sisters who were not in college or college bound who had been and would be more affected by racism and white supremacy in America. This, I knew, would not be an easy task. After all, a lot of black college students thought of themselves as being better than the brothers and sisters from the streets. Even though many of the college students had themselves come out of those same conditions and communities, they had no interest in being reminded of that fact or confronted up close with the harsh realities of extreme poverty, racism, and confusion. Not when they had the chance to hide out in what seemed the semi-secure world of the college dorm. For their part, the youth in the streets were suspicious of the college students, most of whom seemed to take pride in being part of the system and accepting and cooperating with white authority figures, white lies, and white ways of doing things. If accused of acting white, talking white, and thinking white, most black college students would reject the charge, saying that they were not being white, that they were just doing what was right, and though the words white and right were one and the same. As though the words white and right were one and the same. Get my aqua in. The most diverse factor was the plain fact that street kids could feel that college students thought they were better than them, that college students somehow had all the answers. This attitude of superiority, when it met with the sense of inferiority felt by those who were undereducated, presented a class that sometimes became violent. The college students who talked the most about being concerned about their community always pointed to this tension as the reason they could not do any practical work with these young people. It was the same reason they used after graduation to abandon these neighborhoods and the problems that came along with them. So I had an idea. We would require all college students who were interested in joining the nationwide organization we were founding to develop a specific project in their local community in order to qualify for membership. I would place pressure on them and challenge the depth of their commitment and level of sincerity by suggesting that if they were not involved in the community work, then they were just talking, better yet, faking it. The challenge I presented to students across the country, however, will soon confront me as well.
It had been a year of walking from either Penn Station or the 42nd Street Bus Depot through the business section of my office on Madison Avenue. The fact that African Americans were not part in any significant way of the day-to-day -day business transactions that represented power was obvious even to a casual stroller. Every day, the scenes that I saw appalled me as I realized that even though I was from New York, there had been a qualitative change for the worse even in the few years since I had lived there. Desperation seemed more like the accepted norm for blacks and it gripped not only the adults and the young adults, but the children as well. When, where once there had been some small, if feeble, attempt in early years by adults to protect the young, it now seemed that even black adults considered children fair prey in their evil games. Children were no longer children, just smaller versions of adults. They had to learn immediately how to fend for themselves. The environment in which these children had to grow up was unremittingly harsh. The children would make up the first generation to witness and experience the complete death of love between black folks. Love between children and children, love between parents and children, between some neighbors and some children was what made racism and poverty bearable when I was growing up. But today, I could see every day as I walked to work how the processes and practices of institutionalized white racism and the way those whites in power had designed, organized, and maintained the lifestyle of urban Africans had created a pressure cooker in which blacks could no longer survive. It was nearly impossible to see through the stream and stress. We had now accepted the view that we ourselves were the cause of the conditions we found ourselves trapped in. History didn't count. We were to blame for our predicament. Like desperate rats in a cage, we began to fold under the pressure of imprisonment, eating each other, consuming our children with no hesitation or afterthought. It was during the year that I met Tsunami. No, Tusani. <laughs> Tsunami. I'm so silly. It was during the year that I met Tasani, a young girl living in what the New York City government was pleased to call a welfare hotel. These hotels were former luxury hotels, mostly located in midtown Manhattan, that the city had converted into emergency temporary housing for homeless families. The catch was that the family of four or five persons or more lived in one hotel room at the same time for an unlimited period of time at the same nightly price that the former luxury hotel would charge a guest. Thus, the landlords of these hotels were receiving monthly rent of up to $3,500 per family per room. This lucrative collusion between the city government and the landlords had become so large, profitable, and political that even though for less money the city would have built a separate house for each family, they allowed the scandal to continue. Homeless families, meanwhile, were trapped in one rooms where there were no stove or kitchen, no hot pots or cooking allowed, no hotel services, and no privacy. This resulted in creating, right in the middle of big money Manhattan, a ghetto with 50 times the concentrated despair of the projects. The difference in effect was like a drunk who drinks wine cup coolers and a drunk who drinks a case of Bacardi 151. Nita and Tusani's Nita was Tusani's mother. When I met her, she was outside one of the welfare hotels yelling at the Manhattan Borough President, a prominent black politician who was holding a press conference to discuss the negative effect the homeless were having on business in the area. Nita was one of the mothers the politician had stopped to use as some sort of prop before the cameras. He pointed her out to the press because she was carrying a six-pack of beer. He said that she should be buying milk for her children, but instead she was using welfare money to get drunk. Without the slightest bit of embarrassment, Nita turned to the politician and the cameras and shouted all i know is i paid a lot more fucking money for this beer down here because these goddamn jews and koreans raised the prices because they know niggas ain't got no other store to go to and no way to get there impressed by her spunk i went over to her and introduced myself i laughed and told her i thought it was funny the way she flipped the situation on the fake black politician we talked and she told me about the welfare hotels the drug the prostitution the physical abuse the building code violations and the murderers that and the murders that went on inside she added that she had an 11 year old daughter named to Sonny, whom she wished I could meet. It would have to be another time she was in the hospital with hepatitis caught after smoking crack. What? She gave me the hospital's address and her daughter's room number and said maybe I could help out. I ordered a box of cookies and had them sent to the hospital under Tusani's name. I began immediately making calls, collecting information on the welfare hotels. To my amazement, in Nita's building, according to the statistics, 
statistics. There were about 450 families and 3,000 children. Around the corner was another welfare hotel of similar size. The hotels I discovered were not only in all of New York's five boroughs, they were in existence across the country. Almost everyone who had lived in them were black or Latino. Sitting in my office, the numbers and data raced around my head. I grew more and more disgusted as I realized the calamity these numbers revealed. We would lose almost every young person raised in this environment. When I added up the numbers of such hotels and estimated the number of children being raised in them, I was staggered. It was no exaggeration to conclude that some 50,000 young minds were at risk. The system that had placed our people in such places was wicked. There was no other term for it. That system, I became convinced, operated with the full design, control, organization, and permission of the whites in charge. It benefited thousands of white families who lived in the suburbs and would swear to God that they weren't racist and had never done a mean or harmful thing to a black person. Suddenly, a young girl standing at my office doorway jolted me out of my thoughts and anger. She appeared in my office unannounced. She was petite, just under five feet tall. She was a dark chocolate girl with big brown eyes. The whites of her eyes, however, were yellow. Her hair was damaged. It looked like it was half perm, half afro, with knots around the edges, which clustered around her neck. Some sections were an inch long. Some sections were two inches long. She was wearing a big shirt, a couple sizes too big for her, and baggy jeans. She held her head tilted downward as though she looked straight as though looking straight ahead took too much energy. She smelled dirty. She was dirty and smelled of urine. But despite all of this, she was beautiful, a fact that I was sure she did not know. I'm Tasani, she said softly. My mother said you sent the cookies. Thanks. Come in, I said. She sat down, still looking down. How do you feel? I asked. I'm okay. Your mother told me about the hepatitis. When did you get out? Yeah, sometimes my mother has a big mouth, and she lies, too. Her big yellow eye brown her big yellow brown eyes searched the walls, examining my pictures of public enemy, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, the Soweto Uprising, and KRS one. She was in no way aggressive or smart mouth. Quite the opposite. She was soft spoken and utterly lacking in self confidence. I thought she was an old lady, she said with a half smile. How old is you? Seventeen? Eighteen? No, I'm twenty one. And you work in a church? I work for black people, I said, because we all need cause we need all the help we can get. And I work for a black man. You have something against white people? A lot, I said flatly, don't you? They never did nothing to me. I have nothing against them. She paused and then added, I have a white girlfriend in the school I used to go to before they kicked me out. She was a real nice house. She has a real nice house and every toy. toy. Oh, and I know this white politician lady that took my whole family on a trip to Washington to speak about the hotel thing. I haven't seen her since, but she sent me a game for Christmas. I asked, do you like the hotel? I hate it. They never clean it up and the pipes is busted. That's how I got sick. How? Because the dirty pipes was busted and they was leaking into the pan my mother snuck in the hotel to cook with. She was giving us water out the pan and the stuff from the pipes was in the water and made me sick. That's how I ended up in the hospital. Confused by her version of how she got sick and her mother's claim that Tusami was a crackhead, I asked, What about the crack? The crack was in the pipe, she said. No, what about you smoking crack? Who? I see my mother's been lying to you. She tells everybody that I smoke crack. Why? Because she's jealous of me. I don't smoke no crack. It's her. She shoots so much junk in her veins, we ain't even got no food to eat. What is she jealous of? Sometimes my boyfriend buys me things and she thinks just because he buys things for me, he should buy them for her too. My heart was in my socks. I had thought she was naive because she knew nothing about the history of our people, but here she was, 11 years old, with a boyfriend. I knew her mother was a drinker, but now I had learned she was a drug addict, too. I asked her why she thought Nita had asked me to see her. She wants to use you. She's slick. She uses everybody to get what she wants. You'll see. She has something up her sleeve. Where does your boyfriend live? In Harlem. How old is he? 17. I didn't want to look shocked, but I was. I had grown up in what was called the underclass, and now I wondered if it was possible that there was another so-called class under the underclass. Does your boyfriend go to school? No, they're trying to put him in jail. For what? For raping his little sister. But he didn't do it, though. It was the little girl's father who raped her. Shorty wasn't even there the day she said she was raped because he was with me. Who does the little girl say raped her? She says Shorty did it, but she was four years old and she's confused. She just scared of her father, so she blamed it on Shorty. But Shorty know the father did it. How does he know? Shorty know the father raped her because his father raped him when he was little. You like rap music? She asked, a propos of nothing at all. I said I did. Do you have any pictures of Big Daddy Kane or Rakim? Where are you going today, I asked, feeling a need to leave the building to get some fresh air. Nowhere. I can't go back to school because they put me out for too many absences. 
Come on, you come to lunch with me. Tasani gave me a walking tour of the neighborhood. I listened intently as she pointed out things I had overlooked, even though I had walked through the same neighborhood many times. The difference was she knew the faces in the doorways and on the street corners. She knew their various histories as well. I asked her what she liked to eat. She took me to an expensive deli next to Macy's, telling me she had always wanted to go inside. In its windows, the deli had huge pictures of fruits, danishes, and specialized candies. I asked her why she wanted to go there. She said it was where she went when she was really starving. I was puzzled. I thought she had never been inside. Besides, it was terribly expensive. No, I don't go inside, she said. I just stand here, look at the pictures, and imagine the food is in my stomach. She started laughing. Then I drink a big glass of water and pretend. We went inside and ate lunch. I told Tasani to ask her mother if it would be all right if I took her out again tomorrow. The next day, I took Tasani downtown to get some new jeans and a new sweater. She picked out a big, fluffy, purple one with a large gold tee embroidered in the middle. Then I took her uptown to get her hair washed and braided. I could tell she felt like a new person. Her smile widened and she even held her head up. I told her she was beautiful and she looked at me suspiciously. Maybe no one had ever told her that before. She looked at me as if... She asked me if we could stop by Shorty's house for a minute. I was reluctant, but I was curious to see exactly what I was dealing with. Shorty's apartment was on 132nd Street between Malcolm X Boulevard and 5th Avenue. Appearing to be abandoned, the building was nevertheless home to many people. We entered Shorty's living room. The television was on, but only half the picture was clear. The other half had static running through it. Yet two children sat on the floor watching as though the picture were perfectly normal. A woman I took to be their mother was glued to the TV as well. It seemed her favorite soap opera was on. The small boy who opened the door invited me to sit down. I looked at the couch whose springs were popping out, yellow foam screaming for freedom, dried chicken bones between the soiled cushions, and said I'd rather stand. As I stood in the corner watching the scene, I noticed something I had never seen in all my days in the projects. The toilet bowl was in the the toilet bowl was in the corner of the living room, but did not appear to be connected to any plumbing system. When Shorty emerged from a back room, he had on jeans, no shirt, and a rag on his head. I looked in his eyes, and I could tell at once that he was unbalanced. He was also sweating profusely, which seemed odd for such a cool day. So you the lady who bought my baby, who bought my baby girl the cookies, he said. Yeah, it's about time somebody be on our side. Most people just want to jump down our throats and tell us what to do. But me and my baby is going strong, ain't that right, T? She smiled at him warmly. My eyes bounced back and forth between this demented 17-year-old boy who acted as though a sexual relationship with an 11-year-old was completely normal. I turned slightly toward the mother who looked like her mind had long since left her and wondered why none of the children in the home were in school. I imagined that the little girl sitting on the floor sucking her thumb was the one who had been raped and I wondered why they would permit her and her accused rapist to remain together in the same household even though the case was still not settled. Shouldn't the mother be concerned about this? Feeling I had enough, I lied to Shorty, saying, Nice to meet you. I told Tasani I needed to get her back home because I had another appointment. So Shorty grabbed her, gave her a kiss, which she returned affectionately, and we left to take the subway back to Midtown. Visiting Shorty had been an eye opener. While I knew that working with children like Tasani would be difficult and serious, would be a difficult and serious undertaking, I could see now that this would not be a simple case of saying, here, read the autobiography of Malcolm X. There were so many layers of oppression to penetrate before I could even begin to deal with basic historical lessons and link them to their present day significance. I will first have to observe and be very clever enough to realize, much as I had learned living in the projects, that most people like Chasani did not tell the whole truth because it was either too painful or too incriminating. I would then have to establish clearly and beyond doubt that it was love that was motivating my interest in these children. Otherwise, I would be suspected of harboring hidden agendas of my own or of others. Giving love would be easy for me because I felt it had so much because I felt I had so much love for my people, but I knew it would be difficult for the children to accept my love because it was an alien and unfamiliar emotion to most of them. I'd also have to show that I was in it for the long haul because as in my own childhood, they were used the most they were used to most people just passing through and taking whatever they wanted. Perhaps then I could begin to address the problems of hunger, literacy, and the lack of other basic survival tools. So I guess you don't like him, Tosani said, staring into my eyes. What makes you say that? Because you didn't say anything at the house and you haven't said anything since we was there. Do you love him? I asked. I'm used to him. He takes care of me. Yeah, and I love him too. Do you ever think about how much older he is than you? Yeah, we talked about it at first, but he says even though I'm young, I'm ready. He says that I'm a lot smarter than most of the older girls he know. And what do you say? I've been through a lot. I guess I am grown up. I guess you don't think I, I'm some little girl because I take, I guess, hold on. 
I've been through a lot. I guess I am grown up. I hope you don't think I'm some little girl because I take care of my sister Charnel and my little brother Ray. And sometimes I have to take care of my mother too. And what about your father? I asked knowing damn well that was a taboo question in my childhood and in hers too. He's coming home. He's coming coming home today, she said with a big smile. He just finished a five-year bid upstate. For what? Selling drugs. But he didn't want to do it when he came home from doing time before. Nobody would give him a job or a second chance. He was trying to be good, but we were starving. And he said he wasn't going to let his kids go out like that, so he started selling. He was real large for a minute. My mother had a mink coat, and I had a new bike, and he had a diamond pinky ring. Then he got busted. But his mother still got some of the money hidden somewhere, so when he gets home, we're going to get paid. It was it was our stop. The train came to a screeching halt, and we walked to the Martinique Welfare Hotel. This was my first time inside the dimly lit lobby. On the left and right side of the entrance were makeshift security booths constructed with wood and bulletproof glass. The security guards were all black and Latino, young and very large in their physical build. They stood guard, wearing no-nonsense screw faces as though the hotel were a prison. As soon as I hit the entrance, a big black guard with obvious muscles and cornrows approached me and asked for my identification. I asked, for what? But he didn't come back down at all, stating confidently, procedure. I showed him my ID, and he said, are you a relative? I said, no, while at the same time, Tassani said, yes. He laughed sarcast sarcastically and said, well, which one is it? Get it straight before you get in the lobby area. Tassani rolled her eyes, sucked her teeth, and said, she's a distant cousin. He shot back at her, yeah, right. Then he placed his arm around my shoulder and said, let me talk to you. He pulled me to the side and said, listen, to get inside, you have to be a relative or on the list. But since you're so damn cute and your ass is so damn big, I'm going to let you go this time. He smiled and waited for my reaction. I grabbed my ID from his hand and said, yeah, thanks. As Tassani and I walked past him, I heard him mutter under his breath, fucking bitch. As we approached the elevators at the end of what passed for a lobby, there were lots of children running around, screaming, playing, and poking fun at one another. One little boy, about six years old, was bullying another little boy, no older than about four. The words that came out of his mouth shocked me for the second time that memorable day. Aha, I seen your mother sucking boo-boo's dick last night for a crack. You a liar, motherfucker. That was your mother. The guard came by and said, Both of you little bastards, shut the fuck up, because both of your mothers have sucked my dick. Tassani was leaning on the elevator button. We had been waiting more than ten minutes. After turning and seeing the look on my face, he said, That's boo-boo. He's stupid. You have to excuse him. Anyway, he do sell crack, and so do most of the guards around here. When your mother runs out of money to pay for her habit, depending on how they feeling that day, they'll take favors instead. Finally, the elevator arrived. Upstairs, Nita's door was closed. Tassani knocked, and I heard Nita's voice screeching within. Tassani yelled, It's me, Ma. I'm with the girl from the church. Nita opened the door a crack and stuck her skinny black face in the space. She looked at me and flashed a fake half smile. Then she looked at Tassani, opened her eyes wide, and said, Come on in. Come in here, Tassani. She let Tassani in and gestured for me to wait. Through the closed door, I heard Nita get angry. Where the fuck did you get all that shit from? She said, referring... I suppose to Tassani's new clothes I heard Tassani's voice trying to whisper her response she bought it for me did you ask her for it no, I didn't ask her for nothing. She just bought it for me. Then I heard a smack and a noise that was probably Tassani falling to the floor. Bitch, don't you get smart with me. I'll knock your damn teeth down your throat. I heard Tassani breathing loud and began to feel stupid and guilty because she had already told me about her mother's jealous rages, which I hadn't bothered to take very seriously. Suddenly, the door was snatched open. Nita stood there, wide-eyed and mean-faced, looking like looking nothing like the woman I had met outside the other day. She had one hand on her hip and her neck working overtime as she proceeded to put me in my place. Look, let me tell you what the problem is. You go out and buy Tassani all this shit, then I gotta deal with her little fucked up attitude when she thinks she's cute up in here. You don't know Tassani, you just met her. She's a smart ass little tricky bitch. Ma, Tassani attempted to interrupt. How in the hell you gonna talk when I'm already talking? See, that's what I mean. She forgets who the hell's in charge around here. I realized then that I really didn't know Nita or Tassani. I was just trying to help out in some way that would eventually make a difference. That's what I thought Nita had asked me to do in the first place. Now this woman standing before me seemed completely crazed, even mentally disturbed. I decided right there that whatever Tassani had done in her 11 years of life, it did not warrant the abuse of treatment, rage, and what seemed like hatred from her own daughter that her mother was heaping upon her. Seeing the concern in my face, however, did not stop Nita's show. Now, that now what what is I'm supposed to do when Sherelle and Ray Ray get back home and they ain't got shit and you bought Tassani all this shit? She turned to Tassani and said, How much did that goddamn sweater cost? $68, Tassani reluctantly murmured. Nita flew off the handle and renewed energy. $68? 
68 goddamn dollars. I could have feed my whole family for two weeks for $68, but instead you wearing $68 on your back? Take it off. Take it off right now and give it back. Tasani, with eyes filled with tears that refused to fall as though she had been through the torture many times before, took the sweater off and handed it to her mother. She stood silent in the middle of the cluttered floor, clad in just her dirty yellow used-to-be white bra and her new jeans. Her mother came over to me, turned the sweater right side up, and gave it to me. I want you to remember one thing. Tasani is black. She ain't nothing but a black nigga. She ain't no princess, bitch. She's a nigga just like everybody else around here, and she was born to suffer. She don't need no special treatment, and she sure don't deserve none. Now, you take this, and you can go. I turned around and fled that filthy madhouse as quickly as possible with tears in my heart. Like a mantra, I kept thinking 452 families in one building, 3,000 children in one building, five welfare hotels in my immediate area alone, welfare hotels in every borough and every major city, herded into these urban hell holes. African children were doomed. It was a recipe for the extension of my people. It was a de facto genocide. I pledged that I would do my part to resist this fate. As time went by, I got to know not only Tasani, but many of her friends and other children too. Eventually, I came to know about 70 children fairly well. Many had worse lives than Tasami, some about the same and some a little better. Tasani and I, meanwhile, grew very close as though we were blood sisters by birth. I offer her everything that I had spiritually, intellectually, mentally, and materially. Project Hotel was my, at my urging, was adopted by the national student organization I was working with and we used it as an example of work that should be done by every concerned student in every local community. It was also a way for me to lead by example as I demonstrated that I was willing to work as I was to give instructions or what might or what some might consider orders. As I brought other students in my region into Project Hotel, we began to share our love, trust, friendship, and understanding. My long-range goal was to found an African youth survival camp. I had discovered with the help of Reverend Chavis that the United Church of Christ owned a facility that they underutilized in North Carolina. Hey! It had once been a black university and when it closed and when it closed the church and when it closed, the church had purchased its lock, stock, and barrel. It had classrooms, a cafeteria, a church, an auditorium, an Olympic-sized pool, many acres of surrounding land, plants, flowers, and cheap trees. I believe that if I could take about 100 kids for the summer months to this facility, removing them from the intense pressure of their inner city lives, we could make some progress in teaching not only basic reading, writing, and arithmetic, but also how to think, how to survive family life, how to make decisions, and even some politics and history, health and hygiene, and whatever else they might need to escape their earned mark destiny, earmarked destiny. I spoke to Reverend Chavis, and he agreed the camp was a good idea. The church, however, did not have enough money to fully fund it. He said that if I could raise the money to rent the facility, Facility, maintain the children and pay all related costs he would ensure my job as a youth director for the commission at a salary of about twelve thousand dollars a year i was happy to accept the challenge i was committed to serving god and my people not so much by words but through my own deeds so i went back to college transferred myself from a full-time to a part-time student and found an apartment in harlem with the help of some friends i wasn't particularly worried about my change status as a student and i observed from Wait a minute, she said she... So I went back to college, transferred myself from a full-time to a part-time. I wasn't particularly worried about my change status as a student. As I observed from my older friends who had graduated with their various degrees, there was no rush to finish, no reward pending, and few fulfilling jobs available to black graduates anyway. It was on the platform at the subway station that I met him. He was a brother, and I would see it. He was a brother I would see at the station almost every day on my way to work. He was blindingly handsome. His hair was very short, black and wavy, always perfectly cut with lines and the latest design, or at least the most permissible for any employee at a firm in the Midtown Manhattan Business District. He wore a clean, white, well-pressed business shirt with an undershirt underneath that any curious woman could see gripped his powerful arms and muscular physique. He was about six feet tall with a small athletic waist and always dressed in the requisite pair of slacks. His, however, were of high quality. And the best taste and well tailored, unlike many men who wore the cheap tight polyester type. I would see him staring at me regularly from across the platform as he bobbed his head to whatever jams he had he was playing in his Walkman. Then he would lose then we would lose sight of each other when we would be obscured by the morning rush. This went on for weeks. One morning when I didn't see him, I thought about how long it had been since I'd been with the man. My girlfriends were always reminding and teasing me just how long it had been, but I knew myself better than they knew me. Love was as serious to me as life itself, a deep and dangerous emotion. I couldn't share my sweat with 
I couldn't share my sweat with man after man, night after night, and coldly dismiss and dismantle him the way my girlfriends could. Quite the opposite. My mind would explore and search the man's mind and would link up as though we were one mind. We would join the compatible and would fight to resolve the areas that we were incompatible. My heart would merge with his and it would be as though there was only one heart pumping blood through both of us. My body would lock into his body and learn its exact contours so that only he could elicit the most passionate and unrestricted hot sexual and sensual experience. Yes, love was deadly, all right, and I prefer not to play with it. So I tucked it away, which was nothing, excuse me, which was not hard since I was so picky and extreme and so few men really turned me on. After all, by this time, I had come to know men from all over the country in businesses, schools, and churches. I knew them because I worked with them, but none of them satisfied me. I did not know if I was right, but I was looking for strength, masculinity, depth, conversation, compassion. I also wanted excitement. I wanted no ass-kissing yes men or an effeminate executive. Not effeminate because he was an executive, but perhaps because those were the ones that white folks felt comfortable promoting. Perhaps I wanted too much. I wanted the calm to the storm, the polish and the roughness, the intelligence without the conceit, the compassion without the exploitation, the handsome without the player. Yeah, right. The result, I was consumed with work and without a man. Now, don't get me wrong. I saw beautiful men on my block in Harlem every day, and I admired their physical beauty, but I could not see that they were productive. Nothing turned me off more than knowing all the work they needed to be done in our community and then seeing a physically beautiful masterpiece made in the image of God sitting on the stoop where, where I left for work early in the morning and still there when I got back at 8 o'clock at night. So, I chose to pass on the many offers I received and accepted looking and fantasizing as my appetizer during my long dry spell between men yes i'm the same way like i just especially with um oh just analyzing myself and having um practice celibacy and all kinds of stuff it's like i can't just accept any brother and like as much work as i do on myself and in the community i can't be with no brother what the hell I can't be with no brother that ain't doing community work or have no goals, no plan to action, like, just not doing nothing. Like, it's a turn off. I did not know. Okay, I already read that. While at work one day, I received two dozen long stem red roses. I searched through the flowers and found the card. It was from a brother I had met at a conference I attended in New Jersey. His name was Owen, and he wondered if I would have lunch or dinner with him. His invitation was unusual because the men that I mostly met at political events were interested in me when they first saw me, but after they heard me speak, their interest would disappear. So I decided I would see what this brother was about at a nice public lunchtime date. I took out the business card he opened in the envelope and gave him a call that night. What's up, Owen? Thanks for the flowers. I was shocked. Small gesture for such a beautiful woman, he responded. It was a corny come on. He sounded like an old man, and yet I knew he was only in his mid-twenties. Then he continued, Yeah, I was doing some research in your part of town, and I see there's a black-owned restaurant that we could go to. The New York Times give Mr. Leo's four stars, so how about it? My first impulse was to say no. I knew, however, that I had been under too much stress and needed to relax. I also knew that Mr. Leo's was too expensive for me to afford on my own budget, so I agreed to meet Owen on Monday for lunch. Monday came, and so did Owen. He called me from his car phone saying he was parked in front of my office and I should come down. I wonder why he didn't just park his car since the restaurant was around the corner. When I got downstairs and saw his BMW, I figured he had wanted to impress me with his car. He whisked me around the corner at top speed, then pulled into the lot and let me out while he parked. While he was performing, tipping the parking attendant before the man had been provided any service, another brother stepped up to me standing on the sidewalk. He flashed a bright smile, showing his pearly white teeth, and a light gap in the middle. It was the brother from the train station. What are you doing out with that sucker? I smiled back and lied. It's business. Why don't you duck out on him and come have a slice of pizza with me? By this time, Owen was upon us. He stuck out his hand to the brother and said, Owen Stillman, nice to meet you. The brother didn't return the shake, but acknowledged Owen through a nod of the head. He turned to me, smiled again, and said, maybe next time. He placed his walkman back in position and headed down the street to the pizza place. My eyes followed him by demand and not on purpose. As he moved slow, confident and rhythmically with a certain obvious masculinity that I saw lacking in so many brothers who, for the sake of not offending their white employers, held their tight ass and straight. Held their ass tight and straight. At lunch, Owen, during the course of our conversation, told me he was a Republican. He said that he felt the Democratic Party had taken advantage of the black people because it took for granted the blacks would automatically vote Democratic. He said this lessened the power of blacks in the party's negotiating table. That was mostly why, he said, he had decided to go Republican. He had heard my voice on the radio and caught me on a television talk show or two, and he said, I think, you're, I think what you're doing with the kids is great. He added, 
I'm not sure how much success you'll have because usually when somebody is raised in a negative environment, it's hard for them to dispense that dep deprived state of mind. I smiled and said, yes, well, I guess somebody's got to give it a sincere and qualified try. Otherwise, young entrepreneurs like yourself will have your business destroyed by this army of neglected young African people. And I don't know when the last time you checked, but that happens. But there happens to be more of them than you. Are you saying that these homeless hotel kids represent the average black youth in America? Because if you are, I strongly disagree. I'm saying the difference between the youth in the hotels and the youth in the projects and urban centers around the country is small. The destruction of the minds of both groups of youth is severe and needs to be dealt with in a very serious way since our family structures are no longer fulfilling that need. And if you want to get right down to it, the subconscious level in the suburbs is extremely low as well. You guys just are better trained on how to behave. It's so hard to have these discussions with Democrats, he said sarcastically, because they always become emotional rather than concentrate on the issue, he chuckled. Besides, you live in Harlem, which is one of these urban centers, and a lot of great African Americans have come from Harlem. It's a shame, Owen, that you can't understand that I'm talking about the rule and not the exception to the rule. I'm interested in the majority of our children and creating a curriculum that makes success a normal thing. I'm not looking for one or two African American superstars. Then I curled up my lips, twisted my neck, and said, and for your information, I am not a Democrat. Oh yeah, what are you then? I'm an African woman interested in creating some financially and culturally independent situ institutions for our children where we can set our own standards and agenda. Fat chance, he responded. Hello, this is your wake-up call. You better hook up with the big boys, because like they say, you've got to be in it to win it. There's no such thing as financial independence in today's economy. you got to pick a team and play by the rules and advance up the ranks. you got to know who the real players are. Then he leaned over and smiled paternalistically and said, Listen, honey, I know you're all caught up with these homeless children, rappers, and poverty programs, but you're too beautiful, way too intelligent, and you deserve to be operating at a much higher level. The Republican Party could really prosper if we had a great mind like yours in on our ranks. Not to mention that if I had you for a wife to stand behind me, I could make some real powerful inroads. That's where lunch ended for me. I try not to typecast certain brothers. I tried to give them and us a chance, but Owens was exactly what I thought he would be. Another ass-kissing black fool who really thought he could be a power player in the Republican Party. Too naive and unsuspecting to know he was probably nothing more than a token or prop. So limited in his vision that he didn't believe black people could achieve anything independently. And so unaware of his history that he thought the reason why we were losing battles as African people was because we had chosen the wrong political party. Experience had taught me to maintain courteous relations so i politely dismissed myself as having another appointment and i stepped when i got back to my office i thought about owen's words out of habit i was careful not to dismiss somebody's words without examining the entire content there there was one thing owen has said that I definitely agreed with. I suppose I just didn't like the way he had phrased it. That the notion that the American government ought not to be given a free hand to make decisions that affect the African people in America and throughout the world. We needed to have influence and power. We needed to participate. But I did not believe that by joining one of the two major parties, we would be allowed access to the reins of power or decision making. I was convinced that white people would change the rules to their benefit and protection and would kill before they would allow any real power sharing. After all, they were the designers of what was for all intents and purposes their game plus most black people were so weak minded that when they joined these mainstream parties they could not stay focused on their agenda interests or needs and instead became consumed with servicing somebody else's needs in order to advance their own individual careers that's why i was interested in the children because i thought if we could create a vehicle that educated black youth to be knowledgeable proud aggressive intelligent and rooted in protecting the interests of african people then and only then perhaps we might make genuine progress but if we were to continue the patterns that we were following we were most certainly be destroyed and dominated in the worst way the next day for lunch my buzzet brought me to the pizza store and so as not to be full of it i might as well admit that i was hoping to see the brother from the train station when i walked in i saw him sitting in the back but i pretended i did not i ordered and got my slice of pizza and sat down to eat i opened my notebook and began reading over my notes on the proposed curriculum for the camp looking for me he said standing over me as i took a bite out of my slice eating pizza i said coyly he sat down with his plate and i started writing to my surprise he didn't say anything he just stared at me i continued to write he had a big smile plaster on his face finally i put down my pen and said so what are you staring at you of course what for 
because you're going to be mine. It's just a matter of time. I laughed and said, oh, yeah, what makes you think so? Because I'm a winner and I get what I want. I'm patient. I don't make dumb moves and I've been watching you. I laughed again and said, so does this winner have a name? My name is Mike, but my friends call me Chance. That's interesting. What does that mean? It means I'm willing to take chances that other men won't. A lot of brothers don't have guts, no heart, so they just walk with the same thin line every day. He began shaking the oregano bottle over his slice. Me, on the other hand, I make plans and then I move. What kind of plans? I work 9 to 5, I'm into my music, and I save my money for smart investments. That's what it's all about anyway. If you follow their rules, you never get ahead. Where do you work? I asked. At the investment firm around the corner. Buying and selling, I said with a smile, suspecting that he was just as regular as the rest of us. I run the mail room, but that's besides the point, he said with no embarrassment, because I'm going to win. Then he flashed that smile again. You have some long eyelashes with big, beautiful eyes. Did anybody ever tell you that? Maybe. Damn, you're beautiful, and I'm going to have you, but it's no rush. He began get he began to get up, having finished his pizza. Here, let me walk you back to your office, and you can give me your number. On the way around the corner, I watched him move. With the confidence and rhythm of a tiger, I smelled his cologne, and it was manly and seductive. His precise homeboy haircut turned me on. His skin was the color of peanut brittle, and it glistened in the sun. When we were in front of my office building, I handed him one of my cards with the church number on it. He smiled, and his soft mustache expanded over his fleshly lips. Don't try to play me, girl. If I call this number, will I get you? You may not get me, but you'll reach me. I smiled, feeling I had caught him good. Oh, I'll get you, he said, walking away. That afternoon, I felt relieved. My days and nights were so work-filled and the lives of the children and challenges of the students, plus trying to keep my head above water and my few classes weighed me down. Chance seemed a breath of fresh air. The best thing about him was that he was different. He had a job and he wasn't a kiss-ass. Plus, he seemed to have some talents and plans of his own. Best of all, he didn't act like I was some overpowering, intimidating woman. In fact, he minimized my importance, which excited me. I, I'm the same way like I don't like when men gas me up too much like I know I'm cool I do great things and but it's like when that's all you you just like doing it all the time like we're not really getting to know each other it's like you just a fan or like you just so like immersed in the idea of who I am that like we're not learning and growing together you're not calling me out on my shortcomings or challenging me or teaching me anything new it's like you just gassing me up like that don't appeal to me you know um uh, that afternoon, I felt relieved. Da, 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 he wasn't a kiss ass. Okay, so he minimized my importance, which excited me. Later that night, I had a meeting with Bill Stephanie, the vice president of Def Jam Recording. The idea was to tell him about our work with the children, show him the rough draft of the curriculum, and to get him to commit to some of his hip-hop artists to perform at a benefit concert for the camp. Meeting with him was a pleasure and would have been an would have been an important impact on me he was a college graduate very well spoken a down-to-earth and concerned feeling brother he wore regular street clothes to work even though he was second in command over a multi-million dollar firm he didn't talk down to people or act like a big shot he told me he was glad i asked for his help because he felt that it was important that we build networks he thought that rap music would be completely taken over by the mainstream because our people failed to work together were ignorant of the methods of making money and were scared to take risks and execute plans from the Greenwich, oh, excuse me, failed to execute plans. From the Green Rit, Greenwich Village office, we rode the subway to the Prince George and Martinique Hotel, and I gave him a personal tour of the wretched conditions. I admitted that the camp was a modest start that wouldn't begin to reach all the children, would, but it would be an important beginning. He told me that I had absolutely nothing to prove to him. He had heard me on the radio, remembered the work I had done in support of the anti-apartheid movement, and had been proud of me for some time. He would be honored to work together. The night That night, I ran my bathwater in a small one-bedroom apartment. I was lucky to have some privacy because you Usually by the time I would get home, one of the children would have found his or her way to my doorstep. As I soaked my tired body, my mind drifted as I thought about Owen, Chance, and Bill Stephanie, three different kinds of men. I didn't care for the Republicans, so I dismissed that thought. Bill was too important a business associate, so I dismissed that thought. As for Chance, he seemed too good to be true. Three days later, on Friday, my telephone rang. It was Chance. Come downstairs. I'm waiting for you, he said authoritatively.
Okay, I said, surprising myself. When I got downstairs, he had a big smile on his face. We're going up the street to the Chinese restaurant, he announced. Somehow, it was a relief for me not to have to eat, to make even that small decision. At lunch, Chance asked me what seemed like a hundred questions. Where are you from? What do you do? Where do you hang out? The conversation flowed freely until he learned that I was what he called a college girl. He said a lot of college women think they know everything, but a lot of simple, obvious, and common sense things they can't figure out. Like what, I asked. What can't we figure out? How to love a man right? how to loosen up and enjoy life how to stand by your man and enjoy life without always competing with him like you got something to prove i said yeah well i'm different oh are you a pro or something he asked with a smile no it's just that i'm real regular i don't come from money or from the middle or upper class any hard time you've had i can match although i don't think hard times are anything to brag about he smiled and I have a deep love for black men, so I don't have to compete with them. But if they fall short of being a man, that's their problem, not mine. They shouldn't put that on me like some brothers do. Oh, baby, you trying to hurt me, he said, faking like he was shot or something. It wouldn't hurt unless it were true, I said confidently. Well, beautiful, you don't have to worry. I don't have no problems in the manhood department. I make the moves. That's why you're here, right? I mean, I know you must be tired of those ducks you've been going out with, like homeboy I saw you with the other day. He started laughing. I told you that was business, I said. Let me tell you something about men's sweetness. His voice was smooth and confident. Any man who sits across the table with a brown sugar tender like you with those kiss me eyes and suck me lips wants some pussy. I don't care if he's showing you engineering plans for the next rocket to the moon. Them thighs and that ass gonna get his blood pumping. I started laughing loud. It had been a long time since somebody talked raw and plain to me, and I liked it. No fronting, no politics, just regular, just plain old regular conversation. What's so funny, he asked. You're crazy, I said, still smiling. Anyway, my point is, I can look in your eyes and see that either nobody's loving you or somebody ain't loving you right. But I'm not surprised because there are a whole lot of weak cowards around here. But I'll do you right. Promises, promises, I said, looking him in the eye. What did I tell you the other day? He asked while I sat there with a blank face. I'm a winner. I can win. Chance walked me back to my office. He placed his hand on my back, sending sensation up my spine, and said, Next week, I'm coming upstairs to check things out. You women have to be watched. A man got to know how many rooters are in the barn. I batted my eyes and went upstairs. Monday, I called Bill Stephanie. I needed to find out the exact procedure for making this concert happen. He was pleasant and said that with his 100% support, which I had, I should not have any problem. He needed time to ask the artist. After that, it would be up to the particular artist's attitude, schedule, and what point he or she was at in the in his or her career for instance if an artist was booked to perform a paid date in new york already around the time i wanted to do the benefit then they would preclude his participation he told me to let him handle the artist i should take care of the administrative responsibilities including developing and financing the production budget that meant arranging the concert hall rental fee lights equipment transportation advertisement etc that would keep me busy while he worked on the artist he also gave me the name of his assistant since he was often traveling in other parts of the country Meanwhile, I met with the students in my region from the Nationwide Student Youth Organization. We each gave each other updates on our various community projects. Oddly enough, when I mentioned the progress I had made on the camp curriculum and my plans for a benefit rap concert, students who had given every reason why they wouldn't, couldn't work on the Project Hotel suddenly became interested in signing up. I made it clear that they could not work on the concert if they weren't willing to work with the children. We put together a list of additional fundraising ideas and delegated responsibilities to various students to explore them. I'm a I was high and we had a good core of serious and committed hard workers. I soon received a call from Owen who wanted to go out. I had been seeing Chance and talking to him on the phone, so I really wasn't interested in going anywhere with Owen. He probably he was probably anticipating my rejection. So he had a check for me. So he had a check for me for the children, a token of his commitment. He also said he had a list of potential fundraising sources. He added that if I could control my temper, I might make some headway with some of the people on the list who, while I might find them politically repulsive, were basically concerned black folk. He asked if he could come up on Friday and bring the check and the list and maybe have a drink. I told him that I did not drink. I'd have to pass on the invitation, but that humbly, yes, I needed all the help I could get. I would wait for him in my office Friday evening so he could drop the information and the check off. He sighed as though he did not get... He sighed as though he did not get what he really wanted, but somehow he sensed that this was one of those take-it-or-leave-it deals. Friday evening came, and I sat waiting for my Republican for two and a half hours. At 10.30 p.m., I left my office pissed. The following week, Chance and I spoke. It was nice getting to know him softly. I felt more secure this way. Instead of having him just jump in my bed, we got to kick it around for a while, talk, laugh, or go to the park. I knew the slower we took 
it and coming together, the closer our attachment would be. I had already started to depend on him as my release. He helped me to let go, and I found myself comfortable with him taking over and directing everything when I was in his presence. In every other area of my life, I was the director of everything and everyone. That is my story. Ugh, be having to do everything all the time, make all the decisions. Like, sometimes when you get home or when you're with a man, you just want to relax and allow men to be men. And like, not have to worry about the pressures of the outside world. Sheesh. <sighs> so, I had already started to depend on him as my release. He helped me let go, and I found myself comfortable with him taking over and directing everything when I was in his presence. In every other area of my life, I was the director of everything and everyone. To be sure, Chance was possessive, but somehow this wasn't scary to me. It made me feel loved. He wanted to know where I was going, when I was going, and how long I was going to be. Is that a red flag? He wanted telephone numbers so he could check up on me and make sure I was safe. This is before cell phones. Back when you had to call different places, um, house phones and stuff. The following week, I fell sick to some kind of flu. Excuse me. I had a fever in the whole nine yards. But me being me, I decided that I had to go to Washington to deliver a presentation I had promised to make. Just as I was packing to leave the office, Chance called and wanted to know what I had going on. He asked me what was wrong. My voice sounded extra sexy and raspy. I told him I was sick, that I was about to leave for Washington, but not to worry. I had taken some cold tablets and had my bottle of NyQuil on hand. He wanted to know who was going with me. It was no big deal. I said I was traveling by myself, but the Metro Liner would place me right by my hotel so I would be safe. I would go straight to bed when I arrived and be prepared for my presentation presentation early the following morning no way could he allow me to travel alone he said especially since i sounded so bad he asked why i hadn't told him in advance i told him i was doing so much that i allowed it to slip my mind and i just realized it myself when i checked my calendar late last night he told me to sit myself down he made he had to make some calls and then he would be right there because he was coming with me sitting on the chair waiting on chance my thoughts flickered through my head at a feverishly slow pace i wondered if chance thought he was slick i wondered if he thought he was going to maneuver me into giving him some in the washington hotel room i felt comfortable allowing him to come but i also felt uncomfortable telling him not to come one thing was sure though i was too sick and beat down to hump that night i was hot but not for him i took my temperature it was 101 one hour later he came through the door of my office ready to go with his one change of clothes on a hanger he went to penn station where he bought his ticket we boarded the metro liner and i promptly fell asleep for the two and a half hour ride right in his arms in the hotel room i kept my clothes on and lay down on the bed i was woozy from the night quilt and tylenol combination i had taken trying to flush out the sickness before my morning presentation as my eyes closed i remember feeling chance rubbing my face gently as i drifted into sleep i thought i could feel chance lean over and kiss me on the cheek and tell me that he loved me the next morning i opened my eyes and found my whole body on fire it wasn't fever this time i was curled up on the bed and chance was curled up and glued to me he had somehow fitted his body solidly against mine fitting into every curve and groove i had to offer my nipples were hard and my whole body was consumed with desire chance had his arm around me and his hand rested in between my breasts i lay still for about 10 minutes luxuriating in the good feeling then i peeled my body away from his and hit the shower he continued to sleep soundly as i got jet dressed chance awoke we went to the presentation chance sat in the back and watched me i could tell my delivery just made him that much more mine as he was obviously taken with my performance I thought to myself afterward, good, maybe he'll see that I'm not some shallow college girl, as he prefers to put it. Maybe he'll realize that there's much more to me. Later that night, once I was back in New York, home alone in the comfort of my lonely bed, it hit me. I was falling in love, missing chance, wanting him near me. As I lay there, I saw images of him in my mind, and if I... And it was as if he could read my mind because just then the phone rang. In my best bedroom voice, I said pleadingly, I miss you. He said, I know. I'm feeling it too. I miss you. He agreed that we needed to talk about things. We set a day for Monday evening after work. Monday morning, I received a brief letter from the Republican. It read, Darling, here's my check in the amount of $200 as a donation to Project Hotel. Spend it wisely. Also, I've enclosed the list I promised you of potential financiers. By the way, I came last Friday night as promised. I ran into that guy from the park parking lot in the lobby of your building he said you were his woman and i better leave you alone now i like you a lot but since i don't know how you feel about me i wasn't sure if you were worth dying for take my advice dear watch the company you keep love owen 
I read the note three times. I wanted to understand my feelings in reaction to what Chance must have said and done to him. The truth was, my feelings were mixed. On the one hand, I felt Chance had intruded because I told him my relationship with Owen was business. On the other hand, I admire that he had sense enough to know that Owen wanted much more than that. But then again, I wasn't Chance's woman. But who was I fooling? I had been seeing Chance, and he had every reason to believe, based on the way we clicked together, that I could be his. Then I began to laugh at the absurd image of Owen actually allowing Chance to scare and outsmart him. If he was that easy to deter, then maybe he needed to go back to South Jersey where he came from. I thought, Chance must really like me if he took it that far. He was obviously serious and aggressive, two traits that I had always admired. Besides, I was sure Owen had exaggerated when he wrote the business about me being worth dying for. Chance would never kill anybody. I let it all go and decided that I felt good that at least with Chance I'd be protected. After all, he had said that he would never allow anything to happen to me. That evening, I greeted Chance with a stern look. He smiled as though there was no way he would allow me to get him bent out of shape. What's the mean look for, beautiful? Aren't you happy to see me? What are you What are you down with the black mafia? I asked jokingly. He began to laugh. You must have heard from that duck. Yeah, I told him to go find another pond to swim in. And how do you know what business I had with him? Chance laughed again and said, Whatever you had in mind wasn't what he had in mind. Later for him, let me talk. Let, let's talk about me and you. He took his hand and put it through my hair. Then he took my hand in his and said, I want you for me, mine alone, you and I, nobody else, no interruptions. So what's the answer? Is you his or is you my baby? He smiled again, knowing that his smile was my weakness. Chance, I'm into you. I'm in deeper than I should be because I don't know enough about you. He threw his hands in the air and said, ask me. Go ahead, ask me anything you want. I want to know, no excuses. Well, I've never been to your house. He said, I've never been to your house. I said... You said the most important person in the world to you is your mother, and you haven't introduced me to your mother, and I never met your mother. I don't know any of your friends, and I don't know your friends either. Yeah, but you've seen the kids I work with, and that's where I spend most of my time. Yeah, and some of those guys you call your kids look pretty damn old to me. What religion are you, I asked. My mother's a devout Christian, but I don't believe in religion the way I see people practicing it. I believe every man is born with a Bible and a Quran inscribed in his heart. Every man knows the difference between right and wrong. Every man chooses which way he wants to go. We don't have to be led like sheep by preachers. We all know what we're supposed to do. Listen, if you want to meet my mom, it's no problem. I'll take you to see her. You know, I live in Brooklyn, right? Red Hook Projects. That's a long way from here and it's a dangerous area, but I'll bring you there and you'll be safe. What else? I need your home number. You always call me and I never call you. I'll give you the number no problem, but I'm going to call you so much you won't have time to use it. He laughed. He smiled and said, come on, baby, what's next? I'm shooting down everything you coming with. He was playing with me, mocking me. I was so taken by how cute he was. I wanted to say yes, but I was afraid. I had been hurt too much already. Everything seemed okay, but I wasn't sure. He didn't rush me, but I felt rushed anyway. So I said, I'll tell you on Friday. He said, ah, come on. Today's Monday. What you want me to do? Bite my nails off? Bite all my nails off? I said, what are you worried about? You a winner, right? There you go. Damn right. That's who I am. He resumed his cool demeanor. I told Chance that on Wednesday night, I would be cooking for some of the kids from the project and some of the students. I wanted him to come. Then he could see where I lived and meet some of my friends. He said, so you can cook too? I get a gold mine. I said, I'll just tell you what you want. I said, you just tell me what you want. I'll have it ready for you. I want the kids and the students to disappear, and you can cook me some nice juicy fried chicken breasts and some french fries. In the morning, I want pancakes. I like them perfect, just like they are on the Aunt Mama box. Slow down, Chance. There are going to be people at my house Wednesday night. This is my work. This is what I do and love, and I want you to meet the rest of them. All right, check it out. I'll do it this time for you, but you'll learn that I got to come first. I got to be number one. Me and you need to get together alone. Wednesday night, everybody had a ball cramped in my little Harlem apartment. Chance and I, Chance, as I could have predicted, was the life of the party. The smallest kids jumped all over him. The young girls admired him, and he taught the other older boys how to box. As for my girlfriends, they said if I didn't scoop him up fast, they would be happy to take him out of my hands. It was plain to see that he charmed everyone the same way he charmed me. This moved me closer to him because I liked the fact that they all liked him. One little badass girl from the hotel said, I ain't know you like dudes like that. I said, dudes like what? You know, the cool ones, she said. The cool ones. She said Chance could rhyme, he could fight, and he was real cute, too. 
What kind of guy did you think I liked? I asked. You know, the kind of like Brother Charles who reads books all the time and wears dirty sneakers. She started laughing. The night ended with Chance riding the train back downtown with the boys and then going home from there. The next day, Chance came by my office with two of his friends, Blinky and Gary. He described Gary as his music partner, a good singer and songwriter. Blinky was his cousin. Neither looked like the kind of guy Chance was. They were real quiet. One of them was so frail, he looked as though a 25-pound dumbbell could be too much for him to lift. They were devoid of the kind of charm and finesse that Chance really exuded. At least, they were courteous. But they looked at me as though they didn't trust me. That was fine with me because I didn't trust them either. Before they left, Chance called me back into my office, gave me a goodbye kiss, and said, don't pay them no mind. They're followers. I'm the leader. They'll do whatever I say. And if they like, and if I like you, they'll have no choice but to like you too. That night, I lay in my bed and made plans. I decided to tell Chance yes. I was scared to lose his attention. It wasn't his fault that I was hesitant because of my past relationships. Plus, I knew it wasn't every day that you found a brother who thought the word of you and was so attentive. I did worry about his possessiveness, though. Red flag. Even though it brought a warm feeling to my heart, it wasn't practical. For instance, I looked at my calendar for the next four weekends. I would be tied up organizing the youth african youth survival camp one of those weekends would be spent in north carolina taking inventory i couldn't see asking him to pay his own way down i didn't think he could afford it the church of christ was picking up my expenses of one thing i was certain the rule my mother taught me don't allow men to stop you from doing what you must do because men do what they want to do anyway the telephone rang interrupting my thoughts it was my girlfriend sophia a muslim student at college with me we used to discuss politics and religion she was calling to let me know that ramadan would start friday night she wanted to know if i would be fasting in solidarity with their community like i normally did of course i would i had been so busy in recent days that i was grateful for her reminder ever since i had met nathan in my first year of college i had fasted during ramadan i found that the fast cleansed my sister System, helped clear my thinking and helped me avoid confusion. Plus, by concentrating on my prayers, I felt I received increased blessings and spiritual rewards. I somehow didn't think Chance would understand any of this and concluded I have to consider postponing my fast. But in the end, I decided to fast anyway. Friday night, Chance arrived at my apartment. I cooked him a good meal. He ate and smiled at me the whole time. I was eating only a bowl of vegetables because after sunset, you were allowed to break your fast you were allowed to break your fast. You still were not supposed to eat like a pig. He wondered why I was eating so little. He said he hoped I wasn't trying to be cute because he was there. I simply said, no, I'm fasting for Ramadan. Who's Adam? He said, laughing. I said, Ramadan. It's a religious holiday for Muslims. Are you Muslim? No, I just do it in spiritual solidarity. It lasts about 30 days and you don't take liquids or solid food until sunset each day. It helps you to, it helps you want to eat a goddamn cow. No, really. It's an important thing that I do every year. For the duration of the fast, I can't have any sex. I slipped that point in fast. That's when he really laughed. He went over to the couch, sat down, and said, That's what's wrong with you college girls. You think too much. Now, don't stress me. I've been waiting for a long time for you. The last thing I need is this who's a damn celebration. He extended his hand to me. He reached out and took it. I reached out and took it. He walked me into my bedroom, pushed me up against the wall, and said, Now, do you want? do you want to kiss me? Oh, don't you want to kiss me? Don't you want to feel me? Come on, no more hiding. I felt his hard body pressed against mine, reminding me of the night we had spent in Washington, D.C. My whole body ignited, and he gave me the softest, sweetest kiss imaginable. My mind went blank. His hands firmly gripped my breast, pumping them gently. The blood accelerated through my veins. He slid his hand down the front of my body and up under my skirt. See, I don't like this. You're not respecting me when I'm telling you I'm trying to go on Ramadan. I can't eat after to after sundown i can't have sex and you try to like pressure me to have sex like that's that's not respectful that's not somebody that love you that go against your wishes and desires all i could feel was warmth wait a minute he slid his hand down the front of my body and up under my skirt all i could feel was warmth moisture and fingers caressing my insides soon i was stretched out across the bed getting what i had missed for the past year soaked and wet we fell asleep exhausted I could feel myself dreaming. Something was ringing. I awakened to the insistent sound of my doorbell being repeatedly pressed. I got up and went to the door. It was Tasani. I told her to wait a moment. I told Chance to get dressed and let her in while I showered and got myself ready. When I came out, they were joking and talking together like old friends. Tasani turned and gave me a grown-up smile, absent of innocence. Her look seemed to say, I'm glad you finally got yours. Chance pulled me into the bedroom and said he was going to leave. He could tell Tasani had to talk to me. Then he joked and I said I should be glad he was leaving because he was going to get up and whip me in a game of chess anyway. 
Tasani and I sat down to talk. Clearly, she had something on her mind. But, as usual, she was very good at holding everything inside until she was ready to let it go. She started off light, smiling and joking. I looked at her with love and pride because in the year that I had come to know her, both her inner and physical beauty had emerged. It was hard to consider her a child. She seemed as experienced as any of my girlfriends, if not more so. She said, I'm glad you found somebody that makes you smile. I can tell you like him a lot. How can you tell? I asked. Because when he's around, you be so carefree and you know how you usually are. Real serious. He's a crazy cutie, though, and a real ladies' man. You better watch him. I'm not saying nothing bad. I can tell he likes you, too, but you got to watch these men. Do he have a job? Yes, he works in the mailroom at a company around the corner from my office. That's good. So you get to see him every day? Yeah, but I'm not too busy. Better not be too busy. Does he have any kids? No, I said, as if it would be a disaster if he did. Why you say it like that? How old is he anyway? 22. Where he from? Brooklyn. Red Hood Projects. Oh, then he definitely has at least one kid. A nigga that fine? I mean, it ain't no thing or nothing, but you should ask him. Don't wait for him to tell you because they never do. I started to feel uncomfortable with the idea of my student becoming my teacher. I was uncomfortable with receiving a lesson on life that I probably should have already known. I changed the subject, but she caught my attitude and said, It's just that you real nice. I don't have to tell you how there ain't that many nice people left, especially not around here. So if somebody meets you, they hear that tough talking that you do, so they might back down for a minute, but then they find out the truth. What's the truth? I asked, not sure if I wanted to hear the answer. She held her arms out as if, as far as they could possibly go, smiled, and said, That your heart is this big. So what's up with you, Tasani? I asked, changing the subject. It's Friday night, and instead of being with Shorty, you're here. So what's up? That's just it. They locked him up. Her eyes were sad. He's in jail? No, he's in a crazy house. He's on mental lockdown. I held my face blank. I felt Shorty needed to be somewhere he could be helped. Not that I thought he would be helped where he was, but at least he, would, he wouldn't harm any more little girls, or for God's sake, eventually Tasani. She said, I know you didn't like him, so you don't have to act like you're sad or anything. I just want you to know what happened. So how do you feel? I pressed. Like I'm going crazy. Shorty took care of me. You know, I used to always be at his house. Now I'm going to have to be stuck around my mother. Well, you can always come here. You still got your key, right? She felt her pocket saying, I thought I brought my key with me. I don't know where it went. You couldn't have brought it because if you did, you wouldn't have run the bell. Are you kidding? I still would have rang the bell. If all I know, you could have been here doing a hoochie coochie. She fell out laughing. I said, all right, society. She said, what's wrong? You do the hoochie coochie like everybody else, don't you? <laughs> on monday chance came to my office as soon after five o'clock as he could get around the corner he was hyped up and real close on my ass give me some tongue he said with his sexy smile this is my office i protested trying to cool him out until later he closed my office door and locked it he edged his way around the desk and said when your man says give me some you give me some he stood over me. I got up out of my chair. He proceeded to chase me around the chair and then back around my small office. When I couldn't get away, he pushed me up against the wall, grabbed my titties, and started tonguing me down. I slid to the floor. He sat on top of my lap with his legs stretched out on either side of me. You better be careful, I said. You might make a baby. What's wrong with making a baby, he asked. Nothing. Have you ever made one? His face turned serious. Oh, so this is a setup. What? Don't play dumb with me. You wanted to ask me if I had any kids anyway, so you just decided to slide it in right there. Well, do you? Yes, I have a son. My heart dropped, but I didn't let him see it. But I didn't let him see. How old is he, I asked. He's eight and a half months old. Oh, my God, I said. He was just born. Chance picked up his jacket and headed toward the door. Where are you going, I asked. Listen, I know what time it is. It's over. It's over because you a college girl. You college girls don't like niggas that have kids because y'all got to start off with a clean slate, fresh with a proper family, right? And a proper husband, right? And a white picket fence, huh? No, wait, I said. It's not like that. It's just that babies come through mothers. If your son is only eight and a half months old, you must have a girlfriend. And you've been pumping my head up with all of this. It's going to be me and you, just us, and we can win for how many months now, Chance? For four months, you've been telling me this. It is you and me. I'm not with her. I don't even love her. I love my son, but I don't love her. She's a project girl. She's got no sense. She's lazy. She don't do nothing for herself. She's nothing like you. She definitely can't be trusted. I didn't even know at first if the kid was mine because she was playing games with this other kid because he was some big time drug dealer. So I said, I lay low see if the kid is mine because i didn't want to be fucked up like my pops and if it is mine i take care of my responsibility i don't know i said slowly listen I love you, girl. You different than all these whores. I don't know why one of these crazy niggas out here ain't married you yet. They were stupid to let me meet you because you mine now. Then he looked me in my eyes and said, you, st you still mine, right? This is interesting because it's kind of like 
how he stopped her when she was like, all right, I'm leaving because Project Girls ain't with all this. It's like that. They be trying to manipulate or guilt trip you. Like, be ha trying to have you make you think you crazy um, for pointing out shit in them. Like, you ain't even brought up the whole fact that you had a son and y'all been talking for at least four months. Like, I had that happen once with a guy when I found out and confronted him about it. He got irate and cut me off. Like, I wasn't upset that he had a child. Like, I still would have talked to him. But the fact that, like, all this time had passed by and I don't even know you got children, like that bothers me like how you got whole kids out here and you not speaking on the fact that like you got children like are you involved in their life are you ashamed like um rock with that um you still are mine right i don't know i gotta think because you didn't even tell me when were you gonna tell me i wanted to get in good with you first i didn't want to lose you he's just a baby he's harmless i'll bring him to your apartment you do like babies don't you who me Come on. I love all my people, especially the children. Maybe that's my problem. Too much love. I paused to think and then ask, so who does the baby live with anyway? The baby lives with her in her parents' house. So you got to go to her house to see him? Yeah, but it ain't nothing. Look, don't think she wants me because she don't. She leave the baby with her moms and go out. I call the mom. She tell me when I can come see him. They let me check him for a couple of hours in their presence and then, I, and then I'm out. She don't even be there. She out doing whatever she does best. <clears throat> I said, I don't know. I got to think about this. He said, all right, baby. Well, you let me know. But I'm telling you, me and you, we can win. I can feel it. By the end of the week, I couldn't take it anymore. Late one night, I talked to my girlfriend, Jasmine, who told me I was making a big thing out of nothing. I asked her how she could call a human life nothing. She said that all these guys like Chance had babies. He's sweating you, chasing you, calling you. She said, you better jump on it while it's hot. I felt the whole situation might cause me more headaches than I needed. She said I would have headaches anyway if I left him because I was in love. She went on to say I might as well feel good even though the situation was not perfect. I asked her if she would take me in her car to, to Red Hook to see him. I was miserable and couldn't wait any longer. She asked if I thought it was safe to be roaming around the projects. I told her I was filled with curiosity and had to go there. She shouted, you've never even been there before? I told her not to make an issue out of it because I had my own apartment. Chance, I explained, lived with his mother. We both worked in Manhattan, so he chills at my place. She said, I'm coming now. <clears throat> we arrived at Red Hook at about midnight. Just like my memories of the projects, people were still up milling out about outside like it was 8 p.m. I knew the number of chances building, but I couldn't remember his apartment number or if he had told me at all. But I told Jasmine I wasn't leaving until I found him. She giggled and in a she giggled and in a carefree way said, Okay, so we'll call him. She faced the building and at the top of her lungs she screamed, Chance, where are you? Chance, somebody looking for you, Chance, where you at? I joined in and we called some more. Just then, out of the corner like a rat, appeared Blinky. He put his finger up to his mouth and said, Shh, shh, what are you doing? Where's Chance, I asked. Does he know you here? Where's he at? I pushed. Did he tell you you... Did you tell him you were coming here? No, but I need to see him right now, I said firmly. You better stay right here. I'll go and get him. His mom's is real religious, and it's way too late for you to go knocking on his door. Well, how come it's all right for you to go knocking on his door? Look, I'm family. Me and Chance been together since I was your high, but you just chill right here. I waited patiently while Jasmine took out her bright red lipstick and wrote all over the bench. That's right, Chance. I want you back. After a long while, Chance emerged out the darkness looking good, strong, and light on his small feet. Before I could say anything, he grabbed me. He started kissing me all over the face and said, College girl, what you doing all the way out here at this time of night? Then he flashed a smile that dislodged my senses and said, You must really love me. I do, I said, forgetting that Jasmine was even there. I want you back. I'm sorry. I can handle it. Just me and you, right? That's right, baby, because we can win. Then he grabbed my hand and asked how I had come to Red Hook. I pointed at Jasmine's car, and he said, let's go. I'm in there. With me in one hand and his Nike overnight bag in the other, we got in the car, and Jasmine dropped us in Harlem, where we quickly made up for lost time. The next few weeks, I was zooming around on a cloud i was so gone that i had to sit down and make a real effort to concentrate in order to remember what i had to do concerning my work that's why sometimes i can't be getting caught up with these men because i get so off track it off track and off focus of what i got going on in my life and my business and be caught up in them and trying to make them feel good Ugh, lord 
I had lots of meetings and many responsibilities, including the education, love, and attention of the children. They liked Chance a lot. They even claimed I looked prettier every day that I was with him. I was so hyped up, I introduced him to my mother. She wasn't enthusiastic at all, but I paid no attention. I waited patiently to meet his mother, but he told me that she had been very sick. He said the doctors were not sure of the diagnosis, but they thought it was cancer. I imagined that she and I would get along when we finally met because she was always courteous to me when I called his apartment. He told me not to mention the illness to her because it was a sensitive and emotional issue. I agreed that I wouldn't and spent my time instead comforting him. Chance and I tried to do as much together as we could. It was difficult sometimes with my work schedule and his studio schedule, but every now and then he would accompany me on some business trips. On those occasions, I would only do the work required of me. I wouldn't go sightseeing or touring. I'd just spend time in the hotel room with Chance, discovering more and more about each other. One thing I found out was that he served a year in jail for vandalizing vending machines when he was younger. I was not surprised. Most black men had some type of running with the law at some point or another, whether they were innocent or guilty. The work towards the summer camp was progressing. I had completed the curriculum. I had designed the budget. Bill Stephanie confirmed the... Hold on. Okay, Chance is a long chapter, so I'm about to end after this page. Like, goodness gracious. As a matter of fact, I'm just going to end now. <laughs> I'm going to end now because I done read about... It's going to have to be a two-part. See how many pages I've already read. Shoot, one eighty three to two twenty eight. How many pages is that? Forty five pages, and it still got like mad pages left. All right, y'all. So that is the middle of chance. I'm excited to see where this goes. I presume something gonna happen. He gonna not be who he say he is. She gonna get a heart broke. That's just what I'm foreseeing. With all the the way she's foreshadowing his possessiveness, I can see this going downhill. So tune in to part two of chapter six sometime this week. All right, appreciate y'all for tuning in. Peace, love, and like.